Hi, I am Dr. Goodmanson. This video contains supplemental material intended for the readers of my aircraft design book, General Aviation Aircraft Design, Applied Methods and Procedures, now also available in a Chinese translation. The book is available online from a large number of outlets including Elsevier and Amazon. It is recommended for anyone interested in aircraft design. Greetings. In this video I will discuss a very important engineering skill, back of the envelope calculations. This is something that students coming into my aircraft design classes cannot do well. In their defense, this is a simple consequence of unfamiliarity with the workings of aircraft design. I too was unable to do this well when I was a student. This poses a problem because it renders the student unable to realistically discuss and evaluate the consequences of their design choices early. I will present seven back-of-the-envelope calculations useful to any aircraft designer. I want to stress that if you are a student about to enter your first aircraft design class, watch this video to the end. This will make your life a lot easier. If you are a professor teaching aircraft design, watch this video to the end as well. I respectfully suggest you consider presenting this material to your students early in the semester, perhaps in your second to fourth meeting. If it helps to reduce your workload, I encourage you to assign the video to your students to get them up to speed. Alright, uh, let's address the question, what is a back-of-the-envelope calculation? A back-of-the-envelope calculation is another term for a rough calculation. The word envelope refers to a handy piece of paper, an envelope, a napkin or scrap paper on which such calculations are sometimes performed. Such calculations use simplified assumptions and, as such, return ballpark numbers. Ballpark numbers are more accurate than a guess, but less than a detailed calculation or a mathematical proof. The advantage of back-of-the-envelope calculations is that they give a good insight into the scope of a problem with minimum investment of time. Of course, there is a disadvantage. They only return approximate answers. Before continuing, please like the video and subscribe. Thank you. This graph attempts to simplify what I call the engineer's conundrum. How increased accuracy of a scientific answer requires more time and effort to deliver. An accurate answer calls for asking someone who actually knows the underlying topic. An answer by a layperson represents the floor in accuracy. A cobbler is a layperson when it comes to dental work, just as the dentist is about cobbling. The next level of accuracy is acquired using an educated guess. The resulting accuracy depends on the responder's depth of knowledge. Accuracy is always improved using mathematics, and this is where back-of-the-envelope calculations fit. Complex calculations are required in science and engineering. These return the highest level of accuracy, but this requires considerable effort, time, and cost. Let's quickly define the term ballpark number. Suppose we want to calculate the area of a circle of radius r or diameter d. We know the exact mathematical area is pi times d squared divided by 4. Suppose we're not privy to this knowledge, and we still want to estimate its area. One way of approximating it would be to define a square that envelops the circle. Its area would be d squared. Surely the area of the circle is smaller than this. We could also inscribe another smaller square, whose diagonal equals the diameter d. Its area is clearly smaller than that of the circle. As shown, its side length, denoted by a lowercase d, equals the diameter divided by the square root of 2. Thus, its area is d squared divided by 2. Since the area of the circle is bracketed between the two squares, it is not hard to surmise that the average area of the two squares approximates the area of the circle closer than either square on its own. We now show that the average area of the two squares is given by the simple expression 3 quarters times the diameter squared. Since we are in the enviable position of knowing the circle's exact area, a logical next step is to check the accuracy of this expression. So suppose d equals 10 length units, then the area of the circle is about 78.5 square units. The area of the largest square is 100 square units. 
and the smaller square is 50 square units. And the average area of the two, the approximate area of the circle, is 75 square units. Thus, the area of the circle is 1.047 times larger than the approximation. This corresponds to an approximately 5% error in estimation. The average area represents a ballpark number. It is not equal to the exact number, but it is close. It exemplifies the sort of numbers we expect from less precise assessments. Now let's dive into examples of back-of-the-envelope calculations that focus on aircraft design. Topic 1. The lift equation. The lift equation is well known to many, even outside the circles of aviation. While engineering students entering my classes are well familiar with the expression, many appear in the dark about its real power. They are not entirely to blame, and I will leave it at that. Anyway, I derived the lift equation in my video Rapid Derivation 5, the lift and drag equations. It states that the lift force, L, equals one-half the density, rho, times velocity, V, squared, times the reference area, S, times the lift coefficient, Cl. Usually, the reference area is the planform area of the wing, as detailed in Chapter 9 in my book. Now let's assume that the aircraft is moving at a constant airspeed and altitude. We refer to this as steady-state equilibrium at constant altitude. Furthermore, let's assume that the magnitude of the lift force is close to the aircraft's weight, W. Using the magic of algebra, we can now convert this equation into four additional equations. Brilliant! Four extra tools. This allows us to extract density, airspeed, wing area or lift coefficient using the single equation. The viewer may be puzzled about the benefit of extracting the density. One convenient use is in cruise climb range analysis. It allows us to estimate the altitude change during flight. Anyway, we must only understand how the parameters rho, v, s, c, l and w interact to know when each equation is useful. I will give two simple examples below. First, an LSA of 1320 pound gross weight W0 is expected to achieve a CL max of 1.5. Since the required stalling speed for LSA is 45 kcas, what wing area S will this require? Of course the maximum lift coefficient is the largest value of the lift coefficient and is associated with the lowest airspeed an airplane can attain, the stalling speed. CL max is typically obtained in conceptual design using methods such as those presented in section 9.5.5 in my book, or through wind tunnel testing, or various computational fluid dynamics methods, and eventually during flight testing. To estimate a ballpark wing area required to achieve the 45 kcas stalling speed, we select the third equation from the left, and then plug and chug to get 128.3 square feet. This value is in the ballpark of many existing 1,320-pound LSAs. The next example, what is the lift coefficient CL at which the LSA must operate when flying at 120 kTAS at 10,000 feet, where rho equals 0.001756 slugs per cubic foot? Here we pick the last equation of the four and plug and chug to get 0.2856. Later topics in this video show why it might come in handy to extract this value. Alrighty, let's go to topic 2. Topic 2. The thrust to weight ratio. Again, assuming steady state equilibrium, it holds that the lift L must equal the weight W and drag D must equal the thrust T. Note that this does not hold for climb or descent. Also of interest is the ratio between lift and drag, called L over D, or glide ratio, or lift to drag ratio, as shown here. It is one of the most important design parameters in aircraft design. Note that it is also written as LD. From this it holds that by dividing the second equation by the first one, we can say that the ratio of thrust to weight is equal to the ratio of drag to lift or alternatively, the inverse of the lift-to-drag ratio. The thrust-to-weight ratio is another super-important design parameter in aircraft design. 
Now let's apply it to determine the thrust required to propel the airplane. A 1320-pound LSA is expected to have an L of D of 10 in cruise, also written as LD sub C equals 10. What thrust will this require? To quickly determine, let's solve the above expression for thrust, T. Substitute 1320 pounds and LTC of 10 to get 132 pounds. This means that whatever the power plant, it better deliver 132 pounds of thrust at this flight condition. This can be applied to any kind of aircraft. For instance, let's apply it to a Gulfstream 4 class aircraft. A 50,000 pound business jet is expected to have an L over D of 15 in cruise. LTC is equal to 15. What thrust will this require? Substituting 50,000 pounds and LTC of 15 yields 3,333 pounds. This means that at this condition, using two turbofan engines, each must deliver 1,666 pounds of thrust. Here, an astute student would ask, but professor, how am I supposed to know the L over D in cruise for these two different classes of aircraft? My response is, first, as your professor, I happen to know the likely cruise LDs reasonably well for many classes of aircraft, so I can just tell you. However, if I am not around, you will have to do what I did to acquire this knowledge. Estimate this for multiple existing aircraft to help you build a database of such knowledge. Now let's go to topic 3. Topic 3. Required engine power. Here let's figure out how to quickly estimate the required engine power to operate a propeller aircraft at some airspeed. Again, this assumes steady state equilibrium and constant airspeed and altitude. Study the concept thrust power presented in section 15.3.8, Propeller Efficiency, in my book. It is the product thrust times airspeed. This product must equal the power delivered to the propeller by the engine. This requires a special factor called propeller efficiency and denoted by eta sub p. It is important to understand that the propeller efficiency is not a constant, but changes from zero at rest and varies with airspeed and propeller rotation rate. It has a one and only one maximum value for fixed pitch propellers and a relatively constant high value for a range of airspeeds, or more appropriately, advanced ratios for constant speed propellers. Thus, in the early design phase, when we haven't even talked to a propeller vendor, its magnitude requires an educated guess. That said, we can solve this equation for the engine power as shown here. Now let's apply it to the LSA of previous topics. As you will see, we will be able to extract a lot of information about our design in this topic. In short, we found that the LSA in Topic 2 must develop thrust equals 132 pounds in cruise, assuming an LTC of 10. What engine power is required for a target cruising speed of 120 KTAS if we find a propeller that operates at propeller efficiency of 0.75 at this condition? Using the above equation, we substitute the thrust of 132 pounds from Topic 2 and the 120 KTAS target cruising speed. Note that it must be multiplied by 1.688 to convert it to feet per second. Thus, the resulting engine power must be just about 65 brake horsepower. Now, a typical engine in this class would have a power-specific fuel consumption of about 0.5 pounds per brake horsepower per hour. So, what will be its hourly fuel consumption in pounds? Hourly fuel consumption is frequently referred to as fuel flow among pilots. Denoted by W dot sub F, it is simply the product power-specific fuel consumption times engine power. Multiplying 0.5 by 64.8 brake horsepower gives 32.4 pounds per hour. This allows us to ask, how many US gallons of avgas will it require to cruise 300 nautical miles if one US gallon weighs 6 pounds? Whatever the range, such questions are very important early in the design process. First note that the flight time required, delta T, is the flown range, R, divided by the airspeed, V. Thus, we divide 300 nautical miles by 120 KTAS, which is in nautical miles per hour. This gives 2.5 hours. 
Thus, it is trivial to estimate that the required fuel weight, W sub F, is the fuel flow times delta T, or 32.4 pounds per hour times 2.5 hours, which gives about 81 pounds. Divide by 6 pounds per gallon to get 13.5 US gallons of avgas. The student of aircraft design should be able to start experimenting with this process and ask questions like, what happens if the aircraft is only capable of delivering an LTC of, say, 8? A value of 8 is a lot closer to what typical LSA actually deliver. This would be a consequence of a draggier airplane than imagined at first. So let's quickly evaluate this. If the airplane only delivers an LTC of 8, the power required to cruise at 120 KTAS will be 81 rather than the 65 brake horsepower. The fuel flow will be 40.5 rather than 32.4 pounds per hour. And a 300 nautical mile cruise range will require 16.9 rather than 13.5 US gallons of avgas, all increased by 25%. This is a great thought experiment for the aspiring aircraft designer because it forces him or her to consider what kind of geometry it takes to achieve an LTC of 10. The answer forces students to study existing aircraft in ways they would not otherwise do. Most students of aeronautical or aerospace engineering have surprisingly limited knowledge of existing aircraft. I have had students setting out to design a super-efficient aircraft, ignoring to review thoroughly what already exists, only to deliver a J3 cup geometry at the end of the semester and be surprised by my response. In this capacity, it is helpful to consider a specific range or fuel mileage as a figure of merit for the design. For instance, what is the resulting average fuel mileage in nautical miles per gallon? The average specific range, SR, reveals this. It is given as the range R divided by the fuel weight, W sub F. Substituting previous numbers yields 3.7 nautical miles per pound. Multiply by 6 pounds per US gallon to get 22.2 .2 nautical miles per gallon. Another super important estimate involves the engine to purchase. Since piston engines are rated at sea level, but we plan to cruise at, say, 10,000 feet, we must normalize the power. The LSA is powered by a normally aspirating piston engine. If this engine must develop 64.8 brake horsepower at 10,000 feet, what power must it be capable of generating at sea level? Use the GAC and Furrer atmospheric correction model given by GF is equal to 1.132 sigma minus 0 0.132, where the Greek letter sigma is the density ratio at altitude. It is the ratio between the actual density and the sea level density. First, recall the density of air at 10,000 feet on a standard day is given as 0 0.001756 slugs per cubic foot. Divide by the sea level density of 0 0.002378 slugs per cubic foot to get 0 0.7385. Thus, the GAC Farrah factor is 0 0.7039. So, in order for the engine to deliver 64.8 brake horsepower at 10,000 feet, it must develop at least 92 brake horsepower at sea level. This means we must use an engine in the 100 brake horsepower range, give or take. This is how the designer can look for a suitable engine. Now let's go to topic 4. Topic 4. The drag equation. Here let's consider the drag equation in a fashion similar to the lift equation. The drag equation states that the drag force D equals one half rho times V squared times the reference area S times the drag coefficient CD. As shown here, it too can be split into four additional equations. Let's look at an example involving the determination of the total drag coefficient. The LSA of topic 2 generates thrust, which is equal to drag of 132 pounds. What is its total drag coefficient, CD, if its S is equal to 128.3 feet squared per topic 1 and is flying at 120 KTAS at 10,000 feet, where density is equal to 0 0.00175 slugs per cubic foot? 
We select the last equation of the four and plug and chug to find that CD equals 0 0.02856 or about 286 drag counts. Let's repeat this for the business jet of topic two. It generates thrust is equal to 3,333 pounds. What is its total drag coefficient, CD, if its S is equal to 950 square feet and it is flying at 442 ktas at 40,000 feet, where rho is equal to 0 0.0005856 slugs per cubic foot? Repeating the process returns some 215 drag counts. Now let's go to topic 5. Topic 5. The total and minimum drag coefficients. This topic further involves the drag equation. Using the adjusted drag model presented in section 16.2.1 in my book, we can write CD is equal to CD min plus the parenthesis CL minus CL min D parenthesis closed squared divided by pi times aspect ratio times E. Where CD min is the minimum value of the total drag coefficient, CL min D is the lift coefficient at which it occurs, and E is the Oswald's efficiency factor. This allows us to solve for the minimum drag coefficient CD min. We can thus estimate this important parameter for both existing aircraft and as a requirement for our own design. The phrase as a requirement means in order to meet our performance targets we must achieve a CD min no larger than this value. We do not pick a drag coefficient like a brand of butter. Instead, we design to achieve the required value. Knowing the specific CD main value for our design and for aircraft in the same class helps us realize what sort of aircraft shape is required. If you set out to design an aircraft that calls for a low CD min, then don't design something that looks like this, or this, or this. Rather, draw inspiration from aircraft like these. Here's an example of how extracting a CD min works. The LSA of topic 3 and 4 develops a CD equal to 0 0.02856 as it operates at 120 ktas at 10,000 feet. As topic 1 shows, it develops a lift coefficient of 0 0.2856 at that flight condition. What does its minimum drag coefficient CD min have to be if its aspect ratio times E is equal to 5 and CL min D is equal to 0.1? Using the above equations, we solve it for CD min and then plug and chug to find that the required minimum drag coefficient is 0 0.02637. See more methods in section 16.5 of my book. Note 1. The values of CL is equal to 0 0.2856 and CD is equal to 0 0.02856 is no coincidence. It comes from the assumption that LDC is equal to 10. Note 2. The way to interpret CD min is equal to 0 0.02637 is to consider its implication. Since an LSA must have fixed landing gear, this will almost certainly require a clean composite aircraft. We may also have to consider higher aspect ratio to put. This is an important fact to know before we begin designing the airplane because it surely will affect manufacturing and cost. Now let's go to topic 6. Topic 6. Basic wing geometry. This topic involves basic back of the envelope calculation of required wingspan and root and tip cords for a wing for which we know wing area, aspect ratio and taper ratio. First recall that aspect ratio is given by this expression, wingspan b squared divided by wing area s. The root chord is calculated from this expression, where lambda is the taper ratio. Knowing the root chord, we can easily calculate the tip chord. To calculate the mean geometry chord, we use this expression. And to calculate the spanwise location of the mean geometry chord, we use this expression. All of these equations are detailed in section 9.2 in my book. Then consider this example. The LSA of topic 1 is expected to feature an AR of 7 and taper ratio of 0.6. Determine the general dimensions of the resulting wing. Note that there is no information given about any sweep, but an LSA is pretty much going to feature a straight wing, so this is not a problem. 
we can quickly calculate the required wingspan using the expression for the aspect ratio. Solve for B, plug the aspect ratio of 7 and wing area of 128.3 square feet. This returns just about 30 feet. To calculate the root chord, we use the second equation from the left, unmodified. Substitute the knowns and chug. This returns 5.351 feet. Determining the tip chord is super easy using the third equation from the left, giving 3.211 feet. Then calculate the mean geometric chord using the second equation from the right. Substitute the appropriate parameters, which yields 4.37 feet. Finally, estimate the spanwise position of the mean geometric chord using the rightmost expression. Substitute parameters and crank. This returns 6.868 feet. Now let's take a gander at the original wing and then display the actual dimensions we just calculated. Then let's finish by looking at Topic 7. Topic 7. Initial Wing Load Assessment This topic involves the back of the envelope estimation of selected structural loads. First consider this VN diagram for our LSA. Here we can see that the highest load factor is due to a 50 feet per second gust load which returns a load factor of 4.2 at the designed cruising speed of 103 KS. Let's use this information to take a stab at the maximum shear load, maximum bending moment and maximum torsion of the wing. All are acting at the plane of symmetry. To do this we use these simple back of the envelope calculations. These assume that the maximum shear is close to the load factor n times the design gross weight w of the airplane divided by 2. The maximum bending moment is close to the product of the maximum shear placed at the spanwise position of the mean geometric chord. Then we assume that the wing torsion is close to one fourth times density times v squared times wing area times the mean geometric chord times the airfoil's pitching moment coefficient. The VN diagram for the LSA of topic 1 shows it must react a load factor of n is equal to 4.20 at VC is equal to 103 KS. Estimate a ballpark maximum shear Vmax, maximum bending moment Mmax and maximum torsion Tmax at this flight condition if the wing pitching moment coefficient is Cm is equal to minus 0.05. Use dimensions from topic 6. Note that the value of CM is obtained using an assumed airfoil. For instance, its value for the NACA 2412 about its aerodynamic center is about minus 0.05. The aerodynamic center is close to the quarter cord of the airfoil, which is where a likely main spiral location might be. At any rate, plugging and chugging returns a maximum shear of 2,772 pounds. Maximum bending moment of 19,037 foot pounds and maximum wing torsion of 503.8 foot pounds. Note that the negative sign indicates the torsion rotates the leading edge down. Note that the magnitudes of the moments are also shown using inch pounds, which is sometimes preferred by structural analysts. Let's compare these results to the vortex lattice method, which is a standard method for calculating aerodynamic loads. The vortex lattice analysis shown here ignores the presence of the fuselage and stabilizing surfaces of the airplane to better compare to the back of the envelope calculations. Ordinarily, these would be represented. This image shows the distribution of section lift coefficients at an angle of attack that develops the total load required to lift a weight of 1320 pounds times the load factor of 4.2 at airspeed of 103 KS. In this example, the required angle of attack equals 13.51 degrees. This image shows the spanwise distribution of the shear force along the wing. The maximum shear shown is about 2827 pounds. The back of the envelope calculation of 2,772 pounds compares favorably and is only about 1.9% lower. Of course, it is important to remember that the lift force is tilted to the wing cord at the angle of attack of 13.51 degrees. This introduces a contribution from the drag force, which is ignored in the back of the envelope calculation. Thus, the vortex lattice solution is slightly larger in magnitude. This image shows the spanwise distribution of the bending moment along the wing. 
the maximum value using the vortex lattice method, is about 18,372 foot-pounds, to which the back of the envelope calculation compares favorably, being about 3.6% larger. This image shows the spanwise distribution of the torsion along the wing. The maximum value using the vortex lattice method is about negative 604 foot-pounds, to which the back of the envelope calculation compares less favorably, being about 16.6% smaller. The torsion is a trickier value to calculate due to its dependence on planform shape, sweep and washout if present. The back of the envelope calculation does not capture these details correctly unless the wing is a straight Hershey bar wing. It is also important to increase the number of courtwise panels when estimating this using panel methods like the vortex lattice method. Finally, note how the more time-consuming vortex lattice method gives much deeper insight into the structural loads. The back of the envelope calculations only gives us the maximum values. The vortex lattice method shows how this load is distributed along the span, automatically accounting for planform characteristics in addition to showing the maximum values. Thus, it allows us to size the wing with variable material thicknesses to reduce the structural weight. That said, the benefit of the back of the envelope calculation is that it allows comparison with the more sophisticated method. If that method doesn't return maximum values in the ballpark of the back of the envelope calculation, chances are that an error may have crept in. Discovering that may avert a disaster. We have come to the end of this video. Please like and subscribe. Have fun designing.